Welcome to this video on intermolecular forces. If you can answer this question on the screen, I think you're ready for this topic. What kind of substance is I2? And then you have to ask yourself, does the phase matter, solid, liquid, or gas? And it doesn't. It's the chemical structure. So what'd you pick? Well, hopefully you picked. So how do we figure that out? Polarity, non-polarity, that's something from before, but we'll try to touch on that today. The importance of intermolecular forces is because it's going to help us describe a lot of properties of materials. We're going to mainly focus on solids and liquids, mainly liquids, but we're going to touch all the phases, solid, liquid, and gas. So when do they switch and why are, why are some boiling points higher than others? Um, how can water, which is such a tiny molecule, have such a high boiling point? And I'll show you why in just a minute. And why does ice float and snowflakes have six sides? It all has to do with intermolecular forces. Why is iodine, I2, solid at room temperature while chlorine is a gas? We're going to look at those things. And how that's decided, how scientists figured that out, is because of intermolecular forces. The intermolecular forces are those uh, connections that are between molecules. Much of our discussion up to this point has been intramolecular forces, which are the interactions, uh, the bonds that are between atoms. Now we want to learn about what happens in between molecules. And that connection helps us to understand a lot of important properties. You may say, which properties? Well, it helps to explain trends in melting points, boiling points, viscosity, surface tension, vapor pressure, and enthalpy. We're not going to touch on all of those in this video, mainly melting and boiling points. And so another video to address those uh, other ones and the density of materials. Can't forget that one. The intermolecular forces are summarized in five categories, ranging from the ion ion forces all the way to, well, dipole dipole forces and induced induced dipole forces all the way down. So there's five different types and we're going to go over them here in this video. And the first one we'll look at is the strongest, and that deals with ion ion forces. It's important to understand that all these intermolecular forces are just variations of a theme. What's that theme? Coulomb's force. Coulomb's force is a, a way for us to predict and measure the interaction between two charged particles. Depending on their charge, which is Q, get my pen going, the Qs here are the charges, like a plus one and maybe a Oh, I have a, a plus one. Oh, I have a plus two here and then a minus one. Those charges dictate what numbers go in through Qs. And if those numbers are larger, the force of attraction is going to be stronger. Also, the smaller the, uh, the ions, the smaller the objects are, the closer they are together, the stronger the force. So we've got to remember those two things, charges and size slash distance. So we're going to look at all those as we go through this uh, conversation here. So which of the following is an ionic compound? Just testing your skills again. And pause the video and see if you can figure that out. But moving right along, we see that the following uh, one that's an ionic compound is E. Why? Because it's a metal, non-metal. That's probably the biggest way to tell that it is an ionic compound. But previously we discussed that the uh, changes in electronegativity, also called delta chi, is greater than 1.7. But honestly, if you just see a metal with a nonmetal, you're, you're dealing with ionic substances. You're dealing with the strongest intramolecular forces. Which of the following is a nonpolar compound? Can you look through this list and find it quickly? All right, hopefully you've picked N2. Why? Once again, because of the delta chi, the change in electronegativity between uh, two nitrogens that are triply bonded. Hey, these have the same electronegativity, so they're going to cancel each other out. So delta chi for any diatomic is zero. That's nonpolar all the time. Okay, so those are our thought processes in deciding uh, what is going on. So nonpolar, nonpolar will not fall into the ion ion category. Still Coulomb's force that's acting, as we'll explain. How do we tell... Uh, what intermolecular force is, is going on. We're going to look at the structure. How can we tell effective that force is? By looking at melting and boiling points. 
the higher the melting or boiling point, the stronger the force is in that substance. Take a look at the three that I have here on the screen, sodium chloride, water, and dinitrogen. The melting points are listed there for the solid phase of these three substances. Which one has the strongest intermolecular force? And then I look through and I go, oh, that's 801. That's bigger than zero. Oh, wait, what's that number? Well, if I convert it to Kelvin, I add 273. Oh, no, that's in Kelvin. Whoop, I would have to change the rest of those, Kelvin. I think you'll find this is a really negative Celsius temperature. So this is way lower. So it's actually in order. This one has the strongest uh, force right here because it, it's exhibited by the melting point being the highest. So we're going to see that. We want to keep an eye on the actual properties of the materials. All right. So let's take a look at each of these forces in particular, give some examples and think through the trends uh, within, because even within the categories, there's a trend. So we want to be able to compare an ion, ion versus a, a polar molecule that's dipole. Oh, what are the types here? Well, ion ion forces, uh, the strongest are all metal, non-metal inorganic compounds. So they're, they're the ionic ones. And I'm going to jump down to C here. C is dipole-dipole force. This is when you have a polar molecule and they have a dipole, a positive side, a negative side, and they're going to interact like magnets and stick to each other, that electrostatic interaction. Those are polar compounds. And the last category, E here, is nonpolar compounds. They're going to kind of stick with each other in a very, very weak force called induced dipole. So we'll get to that and describe that in a few moments. Now, B and D are combinations of the ones above and below it. So ion dipole forces are when ions, like a sodium ion, is mixed with something polar, like water. Dipole induced dipole forces are going to be when polar molecules are mixed with a nonpolar molecule, like iodine, I2, is mixed with water, polar. Okay. So we want to recognize those categories and the strengths are in between. That's why they're, they're listed there. So the strongest A down to the weakest E, and that means all the melting and boiling points of ions are going to be way higher than the dipole polar molecules and the nonpolar molecules. So let's take a look at a few examples. Sodium chloride, probably one of the most um, famous of our ionic substances. It's so strong that plus one minus uh, one charge there with the sodium and the chloride that the melting point's 800 degrees. Now, can we beat this? Absolutely. If you take something like magnesium oxide with a plus two and a minus two charge, it melts at 2,000. 852 degrees Celsius. Woo, that's way higher. So the force inside that magnesium and oxygen that's holding them together in all through this lattice structure is way stronger. So it's hard to break those bonds. You got to put more energy in to get those intermolecular forces to break apart. All right. And uh, these forces are typically in the 700 to uh, 1100 kilojoules, perhaps even higher. So uh, the charges help us uh, to understand what's going on. And they are whole numbers, plus one, plus two, plus three, minus one, minus two, minus three, in those categories. And that's what causes the melting point and the boiling points to be so high. Now, what if you had a series of ionic substances here? You can see all the metal, non-metals, which one would have the highest? Frankly, my students have not done well on this because we forget the two factors and how that trend reproduces itself on the periodic table. So the answer, well, if we had the data in front of us, that would be the best way to decide. I would look through and go, oh, I see that the highest uh, melting point is with magnesium oxide, that's C. So that is the, uh, the substance that has, uh, well, that, that, there it is, the highest melting point. How would I know that ahead of time? Well, to know that, you'd have to go through and determine the charges. I do that first. And I see that uh, magnesium and oxygen have the plus two, minus two, and so, but so does the barium. Now, the sodium oxide has a minus two oxygen, but there's a plus one oxygen, or sodium. So uh, we're going to eliminate all the, the ones that have plus ones in there and minus ones. And so we focus on these two right here. 
And if you can see on the melting points, those are the two that have the highest because they have the highest charges. Well, how do you sort between things that have the same charge? You go to size next. And magnesium is smaller than barium. So there's no size difference between two oxygens, but there's a size difference between magnesium and barium. If you remember whoop, over here on the periodic table, I wonder if it'll show up over here, the higher you go up, the smaller it is. The smaller it is, the closer they are, the stronger the force. Okay. Charge is first, then go to size. Okay. And then tell some of my students have answered this in the past. All right. And same slide again. Here's some more data to see the differences between uh, some other melting points. And hopefully you can see the trend where the smallest substance uh, in terms of size and when all the charges are the same, have the highest melting points. It's typically true. There's some exceptions to this, but you're gonna have to go with the trend if you don't have the numbers right in front of you. It's not a perfect, Thing because chemistry has a lot of exceptions, but it's a trend nonetheless. Let's go to the second category where we're going to deal with an ionic substance. And that ionic substance is going to be with something polar, typically water. That's our favorite polar substance. So water has a permanent dipole in there because there is the electronegative oxygen, so it's negative charge. And then there's the positive side with the hydrogen. So we often write a little plus sign with an arrow pointing to the negative. Now this dipole then acts like a weak um, ion and it causes the mole water molecules to have a Coulomb's force between them. And that Coulomb's force then can interact with the charged uh, ion like a sodium or a chloride. And that hydrates, the water surrounds it with the negative side of water molecules surrounding the positive side or the positive ions and then the neg the positive hydrogens surrounding the negative uh, cat anion that's in there. All right. See the trends in this force by looking at the enthalpy, the energy that is released when these ions are dispersed or dissolved in water. So if potassium is dissolved in water, we see that there is a negative 321 kilojoules per mole that is released. And as we go to lithium, something that has that's smaller, if you look at the distance, 78 picometers versus 133, something that's smaller is more firmly attached to water and hydrated with more energy as it's closer together, it's more stable, it kicks all that energy off. And when we see the increase there, in kilojoules, that enthalpy, that enthalpy is then an indication that this force is stronger. Now, this is even stronger yet in something like magnesium. Magnesium is pretty small up there on the periodic table, right there. And that's a plus two charge. And so that plus two charge dominates along with the very small distance. And so the force is getting, uh, the forces of, of, of attraction there is getting stronger as we go to an increased charge and a smaller ion that's there. So those are important substances to think about. So we're gonna think about, once again, charge and distance, charge and distance. Those are the two things in Coulomb's law, all right? And in this case, in this particular uh, instance, it was easy to measure that uh, experimentally with enthalpy. Hey, go put it in a coffee cup, mix it around, all right. So now our charges are not whole numbers when we think of Coulomb's law, they're like partial numbers. Partial what? It's just the concept that we would consider them uh, the polarity of water to be a partial charge. Now here's a little video to show, um, show this in more When detail. a gas phase sodium ion enters water, it becomes surrounded by water molecules or hydrated. The ion water connection results from ion dipole forces indicated by a dotted line. It is difficult to determine the number of water molecules around a hydrated ion, but six is a good estimate for most cations. It's true. Six is a popular number for hydration. But the key point here is ion dipole. And this is the second strongest force. The third strongest is the dipole-dipole, which we find in polar molecules. Polar molecules. It's probably good to make a list of them. Water's great. 
And you're going to see a few as we go along here, like hydro hydrogen chloride, hydrochloric acid has a permanent dipole in there. Chlorine's very electronegative, hydrogen's not very electronegative. So it creates a dipole and those uh, forces then hold together the, um, the molecules and create a pretty decent uh, boiling point for this for these substances. Ooh, okay, let's go to... Uh, I think I got a Hydrogen chloride molecules are polar. When HCl molecules in the gas phase are cooled, the kinetic energy of the molecules can no longer overcome the dipole-dipole forces between them. The opposite ends of the molecules attract each other and coalesce to form a liquid. So the dipole-dipole force here is that polarity that as it interacts with each other that determines the boiling and melting points for these substances. Now let's take a uh, comparison between some nonpolar and polar substances. So this may mean you might have to draw the Lewis structure of the molecules determine whether it's polar or not because polarity is determined by uh, the geometry and the symmetry of those bonds around the central atom. So my list here to the left is nonpolar, and let's take a look at nitrogen. And uh, these were gonna be compared based on molar mass. Molar mass 28 here, 28 for carbon monoxide. But notice that the boiling point is higher with the carbon monoxide. Why? Because it's polar versus the nonpolar nitrogen. So that gives it a higher boiling point, and it also gives it a higher enthalpy of vaporization. It takes more energy to vaporize it. So the forces are stronger there. Now, as we go to the next substance uh, with the silicon tetrahydride here versus phosphine, we can see that their molar masses are about the same. And, uh, but now we see a pretty big difference in their boiling points. Negative 88 is a higher boiling point than negative 112. This is why we need to do everything in Calvin because it's just all positive numbers. But we already know about positive and negative numbers. We can see that the polar phosphine, it's just like ammonia, phosphorus in the middle, three hydrogens around, but not symmetrically because there's a lone pair on the phosphorus. And so uh, we can see that with the enthalpy and the boiling points that the polar guy has a stronger intermolecular force, thus higher properties in terms of boiling point and enthalpy. Now taking a look at germanium, uh, compound hydride and an arsenic hydride, uh, about the same molar mass. And boy, we're now starting to see even a bigger difference uh, or pretty big differences in the um, boiling point and the vaporization. Getting down here to our last substances here that are our halogens. Uh, we've got something around 160, 162, boiling point 59, 7, 97 here. Didn't have an enthalpy of vaporization for ICL but uh, we could predict that it would be higher than the enthalpy here because ICL is polar versus the nonpolar bromine. So these are the things you're gonna have to look at and decide between as we're going through and thinking about the molecules. So notice the trends here. Now within the nonpolar, there's a trend. As the molar mass increased, we see the boiling point also increasing in the same way. Okay, same within the polar category. As the molar mass increase, we also see the same increasing trend in, uh, in the boiling point and in the enthalpies. So they're all the same, the trends are there. So telling the, so dipole dipole forces are stronger in the polar substance, but there is some overlap in strength between the weakest category, induced, induced dipole and dipole. So we'll have to be careful about that as we go on. Uh, so there is a trend though on molar mass, but it, it doesn't have to do with its weight. It's how heavy it is. It has to do with something called polarizability. We're gonna discuss that in just a moment, okay? There's a category of the dipole-dipole interactions that shows up in some special molecules like water. Now, if I were to, uh, discuss a trend of substances in a column, up and down a column. That's called a family, uh, a family or a group. So we're gonna look at a series of compounds um, and see how it changes with water and how the properties change. But just to give you an illustration of some properties here, 
uh, chlorine substance, bleach, boy, that can really disinfect. Did you know they use bromine for the same thing? You can buy bromine tablets to disinfect your pool or spa. And once again, iodine's used on your arms. They use a, an iodine um, a liquid to disinfect your arms before getting the shot. So all of those are used for disinfectants. So that's kind of like a family trend. Let's look at a family trend though, not with the halogens, but with the oxygen family with water. So we're gonna replace the oxygen with, in water with tellurium, selenium, sulfur, and oxygen. And let's take a look at the boiling point and melting point trends. If you were to look at the boiling point of hydrogen telluride, it boils at a minus two degrees Celsius. Replacing that with the selenium and the boiling point decreases. Well, it's lighter. Well, it has a smaller molar mass and that has to do with polarizability. It's easier to boil. And it gets even easier yet with hydrogen sulfide, the stinky hydrogen sulfide gas there. It's a gas at room temperature because there's some weak intermolecular forces. But what is the boiling point for hydrogen oxide? Well, if we follow that trend, it looks like it might be a lot lower. Now I took the and plotted, uh, wow, it's water. So we already know it's at hundred degrees. And so, but this is not expected. So I plotted the, uh, the melting points or the boiling points here, you can see. And then the melting points, I plotted them on a graph. I hadn't seen this before. And, well, I've seen some, I've, I've seen it before, but nobody I've seen has done the linear regression. And the closer something is to one, um, the closer it is to a line and it's some predictability there. And if you were to look at this, then water, who's the next substance, because we started at hydrogen, telluride, so, uh, selenide, sulfide, and then the oxygen water should be down here as predicted by this trend. So it's uh, boiling point should be like minus 70 something and it's uh, melting point should be minus 90 something. If all of the dipole dipole forces remain consistent all the way through that family. So we, we just don't see that for this substance here. Okay. Okay. I haven't actually. So right at the end where those dots are, that's where water would end up based on its molar mass. That's what this chart is showing molar mass up here at the top and then the temperature of the phase change on the left. Okay. Amazing how uh, correlated these uh, properties are. Now, uh, now this is the graph I uh, pulled from a textbook many years ago, and it shows the trend, the linear trend, not only with the um, water family or the oxygen family, you take water and replace it, but if you take uh, a family within the carbons where you just replace carbon with uh, silicon, germanium, and tin. There is the nitrogen family of compounds where you have uh, ammonia and then phosphine, and then there's the arsenic and then antimony to replacing that. And then here's the water one we've been talking about. And then there's a hydrogen family or halogen family where we uh, have hydrogen with one of the halogens. Now, all of these are plotted. And as you go from the heavy substance, which is the, it usually has uh, the element with that's lowest on the periodic table. And as you go up the periodic table, the boiling points go down. But as we see here with the trend in uh, the carbon family, that is a nice, nice, a nice line right there that follows a nice trend. As you go up the periodic table, the boiling points go right down. However, uh, those trends are not seen in uh, these other substances here, what do we see in these trends? Well, we would predict all of these boiling points to be in this area here. I wonder if I can get these. Uh... So we're gonna work on that. But what do we see? We see that ammonia actually boils at a much higher temperature than predicted. HF, hydrogen fluoride, uh, boils at a much higher temperature than predicted and water even more so. There is something unusual in these three compounds that is not seen in the other ones. This, uh, Claire, I'll drop to you. This has given scientists the experimental evidence for a, a new version or a stronger version of the dipole-dipole uh, force. And that is given a special name. That is given the name called 
hydrogen bonding. Why? Because it shows up in compounds with hydrogen in them and oxygen, hydrogen, and fluorine, hydrogen, and nitrogen. This intermol uh, so these intermolecular forces are called hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding shows up when you have, uh, you have to have a bond in there of some X and some Y here with, uh, with hydrogen. So it's not just that you have hydrogen, you have to have a very polarized bond because of the difference in electronegativities. So if you have nitrogen and hydrogen bonds in the molecule, then there will be hydrogen bonding. Now, in order for hydrogen bonding to take place, so how we understand it, the really polar nitrogen-hydrogen bond then interacts. So we could say that's negative on this side and positive side on the hydrogen end will interact with the lone pairs of another nitrogen, another oxygen, or another fluorine, because those are the ends of another very polar bond that it's with, because those are very electronegative atoms. Okay, those are the, in fact, uh, they're close to the three most. Chlorine's in that list too, but chlorine's too large, and so it doesn't fall into the hydrogen bonding category. Once again, if you see an OH bond, uh, along with the F-O-N, hmm, phone hone if you want to learn more about hydrogen bonding. So we see that there, and then uh, fluorine, hydrogen is really just hydrogen fluoride, but when it connects with an, a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine, there can be hydrogen bonding there. So hydrogen bonding is strongest when we see a nitrogen, a hydrogen, or, or nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, in the X and the Y position. You have to have that bond there. You can't just go look in a molecule and go, oh, I see nitrogen there and a hydrogen there. There must be hydrogen bonding. Uh-uh. They have to be connected, nitrogen to hydrogen, because that's what creates the polar bond and creates the, the very polar bond and creates this force. So to go in just a little bit more detail, there is what's called the hydrogen bond donor. That's the substance that has the hydrogen in it, oxygen, the hydrogen, in this case with water. And there is the hydrogen bond acceptor. And that is typically the atom that has the lone pair in it. So water in, it, sub, in and of itself is both a hydrogen bond donor that goes through the positive end, but also accepts, because it has two lone pairs here, it also accepts two hydrogen bonds. So this is why water has such a deviation away from its trend. It can uh, hydrogen bond in four areas. Now, so can nitrogen through its through ammonia through its three hydrogen uh, the three hydrogens and the lone pair. So uh, they, these guys have just a lot of intermolecular forces in them. The hydrogen bonding. So it's important to know where the donors and acceptors are. So just having so. An NH, if you see that, and you're going to see some more complicated structures. If you see an N and an H in there, there's going to be hydrogen bonding. If you see, or an OH in the molecule, or an FH. But if you see them by themselves, uh, an oxygen by itself, or a fluorine by itself, or a nitrogen by itself, those can be hydrogen bond acceptors. So if, if there's someone else that has hydrogen bonding, then they can hydrogen bond with it. But uh, if the molecule has a nitrogen and a hydrogen, oxygen and hydrogen, fluorine hydrogen in it, then it can be a hydrogen bond donor and acceptor, and you're going to really see the strong force there. All right, so those are the donors and acceptors. So just remember, when you see a nitrogen, remember it likes to have three bonds with it and a lone pair. These won't always be drawn. Doesn't mean they're not there. We know they're there. And with oxygen, oxygen likes to have two bonds to it and two lone pairs. So it's always there, whether you see them or not. So these are gonna be the uh, hydrogen bond uh, acceptor, okay? So even if the, this was uh, with carbons next to it, and then some other carbons in here, there's still gonna be a lone pair there. That doesn't change it. That's a Lewis structure rule. And uh, same with oxygen. Uh, but this can only be a hydrogen bond acceptor. It can't be an acceptor and donor you have to have the NH to be a donor. Now, if there's an OH, this can be a, a donor and acceptor, but if the oxygen is there with some other carbons, this can just be an acceptor.
let's take a look at a few examples. Which of the following substances would hydrogen bonding be expected? So when we say hydrogen bond expecting, it means we both have to have in, within that molecule the donor and acceptor parts. So what would you pick? Take a look at each one. The answer in this one is actually um, A. But why is that? Notice I have the nitrogen-hydrogen bond in it. And so there is a lone pair there, whether you want them to, whether it's shown or not. Sometimes it's hard to show, so you won't see that sometimes in drawings. Now, we do see oxygens in ethyl acetate here, and we do see hydrogens, but they're, uh, they are not connected with each other. So there's no NH bond, OH bond, or FH bond in, in ethyl acetate. So it cannot be, it cannot have hydrogen bonding, okay, in it. And if you see carbons and hydrogens, that thing is so nonpolar. There's no polarity in it. You've got to have some oxygens, nitrogens, and fluorines. So the one that's going to be the best is when you have the NH or OH or FH in the molecule. They have to be connected with each other. Let's take a look at this uh, question. Which of the following would be expected to form hydrogen bonds with water? Now, this opens up the playbook some more. We don't have to just look for the NH, OH, FH bond. We just need to see if we have uh, an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine in them. So what would you pick? All right, now taking a look at this, we would see, oh, that has an NH group in there. That's going to have hydrogen bonding with itself and with water. If it can hydrogen bond with itself, it's definitely going to hydrogen bond with water. See the same thing in ethylamide, ethylamine, sorry. And there's an NH bond in it. So that is going to hydrogen bond with water and with itself. Ethyl ether here, the, the lone pairs, this is a hydrogen bond acceptor. So it can hydrogen bond with water. Water is a donor and acceptor. It's going to behave as both. So this is good, this is good, this is good. But pentane, mm -mm, there's no oxygen, no hydrogen, no nitrogen. So it can't do any of those things. So you, I have the descriptions there. Water needs, uh, provides the OH, so it provides the donor. Uh, we need some oxygen, nitrogen, some fluorines to be the acceptor, okay? Now their lone pairs are there, even though they're not drawn. That's why we did all those Lewis structures to get to this point. Okay, and then I give the explanations here. Uh, nitrogen, hydrogen bond. Um, so this is just, will be on my slides when I post those as well. Okay, so we got three out of the four could hydrogen bond. Now we've discussed uh, three of the intermolecular forces. We're gonna just march right along and do the last two. Dipole induced dipole forces. This is when we mix a polar compound with a nonpolar compound. So let's take a look at a few examples uh, with that. So that would be like uh, oxygen and, high, and, and uh, iodine, these diatomics, nonpolar, dissolving in water. So you, how would you expect that a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule like O2 and I2, how does it dissolve in water? I make solutions with uh, I2 in class for my lab. How does that happen? How can that happen? The, I thought oil and water didn't mix. I thought nonpolar and, pol non, and polar do not mix. Well, what happens is the polarity of water as it runs into these nonpolar molecules, disturbs the electron cloud and creates and induces a tiny little dipole in it. For it, it's temporary, it's fleeting. It doesn't last long, but it's there. And that's enough to create some interactions to make a solution of it. Now it's not very concentrated, but it happens. So you can make a little bit. All right, video. On average, the electron cloud of an O2 molecule is distributed symmetrically across the molecule. The molecule is not polar. A water molecule, which is polar, repels the electron cloud, causing it to be asymmetrically distributed and thereby induces a dipole in the O2. This shift allows O2 to be weakly attracted to the water molecule. That weak attraction is enough um, to allow for dissolving and you can measure probably this interaction with enthalpy and other forces but notice the two molecules a polar molecule and a nonpolar molecule so this is called inducing a dipole it's not there normally until something else causes it to show up 
This is how oxygen dissolves into water. Not a lot, but enough for oxygen, the O2 diatomic nonpolar molecule to end up in water. And that's what the fish breathe and the organisms in water. And that's how nitrogen, dinitrogen gets in the water as well. And so this is responsible for the solubility of these nonpolar substances in water. Now notice as the molar mass increases, the amount of, of that gas increases in terms of its ability to dissolve in water. And uh, so as the molar mass changes, we can dissolve more. Why? Because it's going to polarize more. You've got a bigger substance, it's going to polarize easier, and you're going to create a better induced dipole that's stronger. So this is actually Henry's law here when we're mixing a gas with uh, water. Henry's law is going to come up later, not here, but we're going to discuss it later. Just want you to know it's coming. And uh, the fish agree that all of these interactions are extremely important. All right. So the degree at which the strength is there depends on polarizability. Polarizability of the electron cloud is related to the size of the molecule. So it's not because the molecule is heavy, but because it has more electrons or electron cloud that can polarize and shift. That's what makes these higher molar mass molecules stronger in their uh, dipole forces or induced dipole forces. So this is why something like iodine can dissolve in ethanol. Now, ethanol has that OH group in there. The OH group makes it polar. And that polar substance with the nonpolar iodine can dissolve because of that. Now, there is some nonpolar nature here with the ethanol part. So they, that, that also helps I2 to dissolve. So I2 dissolves a little bit better in ethanol than it does in water, but partly because of this induction of a dipole that occurs when the polar part interacts with the nonpolar molecule. All right, for the last uh, category is the um, induced, induced dipole. This is just purely nonpolar compounds interacting with themselves or with other nonpolar molecules. Now, all of these are still intermolecular forces that depend on Coulomb's law. It's just now these induced dipole forces are so weak, they do not um, give a, re a strong Coulomb interaction. Now, iodine, I2, and I2, they are nonpolar. But when they bump into each other, their electron clouds, which are negative, induce a dipole in each other just by being in the same solution, being next to each other, being in a liquid or a gas. So it is a self-induced dipole. So we call this induced, induced dipole. It's happening with itself. Over the years, different synonyms have come up for, uh, with us because of people who worked with it. London dispersion forces, you'll hear me say that, or van der Waals forces, you'll hear me say that as well. It's nice to just say all three so we can get comfortable seeing and hearing um, three different ways to describe the same thing. So that induced dipole here happens within the nonpolar molecule and it gives it just a fleeting temporary dipole that stabilizes it and uh, creates an interaction. So then now you got to add some heat in order for it to melt or boil. Okay. Now I2 here has no dipole, but this video will show you how the induction happens. An iodine molecule has, on average, an electron cloud that is symmetrically spread over each iodine atom. I2 is not polar. The attractions or repulsions between the atoms of I2 molecules can distort their electron clouds. Dipoles can thereby be induced momentarily in neighboring molecules. So this induced induced uh, dipole force is actually pretty strong in I2. In fact, it's strong enough that I2 is a solid at room temperature. So even though it's a really weak force, iodine, as you can see on the periodic table over here, is, is one of the bigger, it's a pretty big molecule. And it's not because it's big and heavy, but because it's big and polarizable, you can create a pretty good induced dipole force there. So uh, this is, that iodine is kind of weird. Uh, it's strong, and so you get the solid phase, but if you add a little heat, you can actually turn um, iodine. So there's, there's iodine. Oh, it's a beautiful purple beautiful purple crystal. And as you heat it, you get this purple haze. Purple haze. That's me. Purple. 
and I'm a haze. And, uh, and so to create a purple haze, you just put a little heat on iodine. That's why I'm showing this one. And with a little cooling on top, you can get the solid to, to, to condense back out. Uh, so that's sublimation going from the solid phase to the gas phase. That's pretty cool. And uh, that's some pretty good intermolecular forces in I2, even though it's uh, the, of the weakest. All right. So what are the trends that we see in polarizability? How do we create uh, an understanding of a distinction within the uh, nonpolar uh, substances? So fluorine, which is small here, so there's not a lot of electron cloud to polarize has a really low boiling point. So I'm doing this in both Celsius, okay, and Kelvin. All right, so 172 uh, degrees Celsius is, uh, oh wait, what am I saying? <laughs> Calvin, that's the melting point and that's the boiling point. Oh, very nice. It's all popular, uh, popular. It's all positive numbers, makes it easy. So the melting and boiling point uh, raise a lot in chlorine. Why? It's more polarizable. You get to bromine and that substance melts at 267. Boy, that's almost at uh, zero degrees Celsius. And then 332 is where it um, boils. And then iodine, which is the largest of those, it has the highest and strongest forces that are induced in those nonpolar substances. Okay, let's take a look at some other molecules here. Methane, CH4, going to, oh, I, so this is the one I have degrees Celsius in Kelvin, because maybe some people like Celsius. Ethane, which has more carbons, more hydrogens, more polarizable, higher boiling point. Same with propane, more carbons, more hydrogens, more polarizable, and the boiling point continues to rise. And you go to something like butane, which has more carbons and even more hydrogens, more polarizable, higher uh, uh, boiling points there. So why do molecules with greater molar mass have stronger intermolecular forces? What do you think? Is it because they're more polarizable, less polarizable? They are heavier, which makes them stronger. They move slower, so the dipoles have more time to interact with each other. Well, do I have the answer here? The answer is A, <laughs> yes I do. So they're more polarizable. Uh, you can't be more and less, so it's A is a, is a good answer. B is just wrong because they're not less uh, polarizable. Um, the heavier is not the way we explain it. It has to do with electron clouds and the polarizability. Now, this is an interesting distractor. They're slower because we talked about heavy molar mass objects have slower speeds, but that's a gas phase thing. And so, um, yeah, it's, but this, they will have, I think that's partially true, but it's the, 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 I would say the greatest truth there is A. All right, so that is the study of intermolecular forces. We gave you a number of, I gave you a number of examples. So you can go work on some homework dealing with these things and some ideas. And so we have five uh, intermolecular forces, but they're really an expression of one. So think of my hand, my palm here is Coulomb's force and it's expressed as the strong, I guess that's the ion ion force. And then there is the dipole force. And then my last finger right here is the induced. And my other fingers then are when the dipole and the ion forces interact with each other. So you're, this is a handy way to remember the intermolecular forces and how they grab each other. And the stronger they grab each other, the higher the melting point, the higher the boiling point. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. I hope you've learned some more about intermolecular forces and how that creates the properties and the trends we see in these substances. Thanks for joining me, Dr. Hayes. Hope you have a great day.